Uh, my name is John Hong. I'm going to be 49 years old this year. I was born in Seoul, Korea. Immigrated to the United States when I was two, two and a half. I don't remember back that far, so I'm told it was around April of 1973. We left Korea, immigrated straight to Chicago. Um, my father was doing a combination of the Peace Corps um, and trying to start his own business at the time. So we ended up right at the Grace Apartments, right, right near Wrigley Field. So about two blocks away from Wrigley Field. And then in second grade, we, we moved out to the suburbs. So um, I went from having concrete buildings next to me to a cornfield as my adjacent lot. I remember being alone a lot and being scared a lot. So typical immigrant story, I think. My, uh, my parents worked an awful lot. So today, you know, my children have my wife as the professional Uber driver taking them all over to their activities. But it, it's a very different world. Um, we had a key, uh, we would go to school, we'd come home, and you'd have to take care of yourself. And this went on from, I remember as early as first and second grade. Um, today, I believe that is a DCSF call and child abuse. But uh, back then, you know, it was just the norm. So my relationship with my folks, I'm not gonna characterize it as typical or, you know, atypical. My mom, um, worked at the U.S. Embassy when she was in Korea. And then when she came here, I think she realized she had to do a job. And I know that they, uh, they struggled uh, financially. It was tough, right? So you're immigrant folks, you're here. My uh, dad grew up um, pretty, under pretty harsh conditions. So they were sending money back as the dutiful firstborn son. Um, my mom actually is the one that I give a lot of credit to because here she is trying to carve out a life um, in the States. There's barely enough budget to go around for her own family and she has to cut out enough to send back to Korea. So the feeling and the understanding of a lot of what the immigrants today go through, especially from Mexico and other areas, um, I, I get it. There's a, there's a large amount of empathy, I, I, I think, that I associate that with. And my father um, worked as a salesman in the beginning, and he was traveling. His territory was the East Coast. So his English was actually pretty good. Um, he was teaching Korean in the Peace Corps to the Peace Corps volunteers. So to be able to communicate on that level in the 1970s was remarkable. Um, I think his English has gotten actually worse over time, but I remember early on his English was pretty fantastic relative to what I saw of my friend's fathers. Um, that's how we grew up, so communication was never really an issue. I learned to speak Korean because I was so curious what the hell they were speaking to each other about when they didn't want us to understand. And oddly enough, I can pick up languages fairly easily, I guess. So like a lot of immigrants that come here looking for some sort of community, we ended up at a local Korean church. Um, we did study that, but honestly, Sundays were my favorite day of the week only because that's the time that I felt like I was with my people. And you don't realize it's your people. Back then you think to yourself, oh, it's because we're all Christian. Up until you go to a a white Christian church, and you think to yourself, are we all praying to the same God? Because it seems a little different here. And that cultural Christianity and my faith got intertwined, and then later on as I got older, I had to learn to separate it. it it's just been a really interesting, it's been an interesting journey in that sense. I was a five foot chubby Asian kid filled with really cool breakdancing Filipino guys in my junior high, right? And the first time I tried to break dance, I actually broke dance because I think my back went out and it, it was kind of rough, right? So then you end up from there. Uh, my dad says, uh, we have to take you to a school because I just invested all these years in violin. So therefore, you're going to play in the orchestra. They use that as a reason to get me to the school that I had to drive into that was not my neighborhood school. And then you end up with kids that are, you know, taking their dad's BMWs and Ferraris to prom. So this, this entire complexity of my childhood that goes from one extreme to the next, 
uh, was just interesting. So what happens when you get exposed to that sort of um, almost polarizing differences, you just become really observant. Otherwise, you, you'll be so mercurial. You'll be back and forth and up and down all over the place with the wind. Uh, so I tended to just look back and try to figure out, huh, I don't belong there, I don't belong there, I don't belong there, I don't belong there. And church was the one refuge. Once a week, I belonged. My entire faith journey and the process um, really, I think the catalyst behind it all was the death of my cousin who had come at six years old. She came from Korea um, because she was born with a congenital heart uh, valve issue. And she was in New York. Uh, I went to go see her. Now you gotta remember, it's my sister, myself, my mother, and my father. That's it in this country. So when you meet other folks, they're like, oh, my uncle John's coming over. It's like, oh, that'd be great. Uh, I don't have one. So there's this real feeling of being on an island. It's total Swiss family Robinson in the middle of nowhere. And to have your cousin show up, there was this ray of hope that just kind of took me over. I was filled with, wow, this is family. And then you meet this little girl at six years old who's sitting in New York and she's having open heart surgery and she's got the zipper. And they had healed it and they'd sewn it up and everything. And it's in uh, seventh or eighth grade. And I remember flying to New York and we had a hotel, but I wouldn't leave the hospital bed. I just, I, I, I don't know, it, it just affected me in a, in a really, really deep way. So I would stay with her and wheel her around the hospital um, floor in a wheelchair. And I would speak to her because, you know, like I said, I picked up enough Korean to communicate. And uh, this little kid, I remember getting her a present and the first thing she thought of was, okay, well, that's for my little sister at, in Korea. When I go back, I'm gonna give this to her at six years old. And, and I just was, I just never met anyone like that. You know, and up, that, up until that point, as I explained to you earlier, my life was filled with what are your intents? What are, I'm looking at people for what's really going on? How full of shit are you? And uh, you meet this absolute pure person, an individual. So we come home and um, the doctor said she was fine. We come home and that was the first year I remember I'd gotten straight A's. And I had never seen that before, right? So everyone's happy and you know, we're in good mood. And I, and I remember I got a phone call uh, from my dad saying, you know, uh, Min died. And my sister's name is Min. And I remember saying, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. She's in the next room. And it clicked what he meant. I lost it. And I remember, I remember just cursing the God, you know, if this is purity, but what the hell is this? Um, and the thing that really still gets to me was my uncle, whom I love very much, my dad's younger brother. He came uh, because they had said, don't bring her back. My parents had decided, listen, um, we're going to bury her in Chicago. And we'd like to keep her with us. So this man said, okay. Um, and we buried my cousin um, in our Calvary Church Cemetery um, area on Irving Park. And uh, the saddest day was not that funeral because it was almost surreal to me. Like, that's not even her. Because I didn't know what embalming looked like and how it disfigures the face. I didn't understand any of that. I, I thought, oh my God, they got the wrong, they got the wrong girl. Always looking for some kind of hope to, to change the circumstances. Um, and, and then I remember my uncle coming to visit later that year. And you know how when it's cold and it rains slightly and uh, the top turns icy and there's a thin layer of ice and then there's soft snow underneath. So we went, the entire cemetery was covered and I knew where it was. And this was the first time he's coming to see his little girl's tombstone. And he's like, you know, which one is it? And I said, it's right here, something. And he's like, okay. And his bare hands is freezing outside. He starts tearing away the ice. And you can see how cold it is. And you can see he's cutting himself on the ice. There's no thought about it. And he just kept going. And you could, 
you can sense the anger and the frustration as he's tearing chunks of ice away. And then he finally hits the tombstone. And there's this, uh, it's like this pinkish hue. And he's wiping it away. And I realize, where's the, where are the drops coming from? And it's his eyes. And he's literally sobbing. And he's wiping away the tombs. That's hard. That was hard. That was the saddest moment I've ever had. The hardest part for me to understand um, in Christian faith was what they called justice. And when I looked at my little cousin as this innocent, uh, pure creature, for her to be taken unfairly, in my opinion, was not justice. And therefore, how can you call yourself a just God? And that's what I struggled with for the longest time. And then you, you know, you always skip the Old Testament. You always go to the New Testament, right? So you finally get to Job and you realize, you know, oh, <laughs> it gets worse, <laughs> right? There's it's a possibility to be much worse. And then there's that line in Job where he comes, where the Lord comes out and says, where, where were you when I created the earth? You know, where were you when I created all the creatures? And I'll translate into like the hood version of it. Basically, are you out of your freaking mind? Who are you to question me? And it clicked. You're never going to understand a holy and perfect God with the fallible nature that you're born with. It's impossible. So at that point, it stopped becoming empirical and became a lot more about your faith. And then that's when my journey really started to go in a different direction. So the thing that I would tell my children, um, and, I, and it's the same advice I would give anybody, trust your network. Trust your, trust your environment and the people who love you. And then have no fear. If you fail, fail early and fail often and just keep going, okay? Don't fail for the sake of failure and be a complete moron, but learn from it, make adjustments and get up. My, one of my dearest friends, a um, guy named Mark Davis, Mark Anthony Davis, this brother and I, uh, we had a good time in law school. You know, Mark's a former professional baseball player and one of the just the coolest cats you've ever met. And I remember I was talking to him at the uh, law school library one day about, man, MD, I don't know what I'm going to do to this girl, man. I don't know how, how am I going to get her to... And he would look at me and say, Hong, oh, man, you, you got to step up. You, and he would keep stood up on the table of the law school library and say, you know what I'm talking about? You don't give a fuck what these people think. You need to step up. And I sat there and went, okay, I got it. Sit down. And he would go on to explain to me that baseball, like life, is a game of adjustments. It's a game of adjustments. But the thing is, you make an adjustment and you keep swinging. I never forgot that. I, I don't know why. That's what I would tell my kids. Make the adjustment and try again. Make the adjustment and try again. Because at the end of the day, God will call the game. Until then, you gotta keep playing. Anything, business, friendships, relationships, um, your own personal evaluation. Everything is about adjustments. So that's what I would take part of that. My name is John Hong, and this is my Korean American story. Mm -hmm.